Um, so I'd just like to start by acknowledging the custodians of this land, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and their elders past and present. We acknowledge and respect their continuing culture and the contribution they make to the life of the city and this region. Thanks everybody very much for joining us today. This is the 26th Sydney NLP meetup and the very first fully online event. Um, it's a bit exciting and a bit experimental and thanks very much Rob for presenting today. Uh, my name is Ben Hashi. I'm head of Applied AI at Harrison and one of your hosts today. Active learning is both the strategic interest and the longtime personal research interest. So I'm particularly excited, Rob, about today's talk. Um, the excellent Stephen Hogg is the Sydney NLP co-organizer of this event. And Stephen will be uh, active later as well, um, facilitating the live Q&A after Rob's talk. Uh, this event, also the first time we've actively coordinated with other meetups. Um, so thanks to Rob for suggesting this in the first place and special thanks to Ayana Medellin of the NLP in New Zealand meetup and kia ora to everybody joining from New Zealand. Um, special thanks also to Damian, Damiano Spina and Mark Sanderson of the Melbourne Search and Recommendation meetup and to everybody joining from Melbourne. How's it going? I'm aware I'm sort of bearing the lead a bit here, um, but I'm absolutely thrilled to introduce Rob Monroe today to talk about active learning for NLP. Um, Rob is a friend of Sydney NLP. He's back for another round after last joining us in March last year, I think, to talk about transfer learning and human in the loop NLP. Um, Rob's, I think, on a bit of a virtual book tour at the moment after the release of his very excellent machine in the loop, or human in the loop, rather, machine learning book. Um, so big congrats, Rob. Um, it's the book I wish I'd written. <laughs> Thank you. It's, uh, it's also the book I wish I read. And just a point of clarification, it's not finished yet. Ah, right. So um, <laughs> I, think nine, I think nine of 12 chapters are currently out. Um, I've written 10 and, and two more are on the way. But um, uh, my, my publisher, Manning, uh, publishes the chapters online as they're written. Um, yeah. So you're able to uh, purchase and, and, and read uh, most of the book now. Yeah, with the other cool. chapters coming soon. So I think the book and today's talk draw on your impressive experience leading applied NLP and machine learning teams, Rob, at uh, AWS and Figure 8, just to mention a few uh, uh, very relevant and interesting examples. The presentation today is pre-recorded. Um, it's going to last, I think, about 50 minutes. Rob, as you can see, is live on the Zoom and he'll be answering questions in the QA. After the video, we're going to try a bit of time for uh, a few video questions, but it's a bit experimental, but we'll see how we go. And now, without further ado, over to Rob Monroe to talk about active learning for NLP. Well, hey everyone, and welcome to uh, my talk on active learning for natural language processing. For those of you that, that don't know, I um, actually grew up just outside of Sydney uh, originally, so I, I thank uh, our hosts, the Sydney NLP Meetup, um, for uh, for organizing this uh, event today. Uh, it's great to be um, uh, talking to people back in my, my old original hometown. Um, uh, but obviously, I've lived in a number of places since. Uh, so I lived in England. Uh, I worked for the UN Refugee Commission, West Africa. Uh, I moved to the US to get my PhD uh, here at Stanford in natural language processing. Uh, and I've worked in, in companies big and small since, um, including uh, launching the, the first NLP products on AWS. Uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, an area that I'm really interested in, which is the intersection of human and automated language processing. And I think this is uh, one of the most important questions in, in all of technology today. How can humans and machines work together to solve problems? And as, as most of you probably know, who are attending here today, about 90% of machine learning applications improve with human feedback. So they're either supervised or lightly supervised machine learning algorithms that get better with more training data. And so human feedback helps machine learning understand confusion on new data for any number of, of use cases of AI that, that you use every day. Uh, so that could be commands spoken to smart devices, uh, videos uh, on the front of self-driving cars to help them navigate, uh, or information extraction from healthcare-related messages. Uh, and this is a use case that's um, uh, near and dear to me. I've worked in disaster response um, and health uh, for most of my career, um, helping out right now with, with COVID, 
on a number of fronts for message processing, question answering, uh, misinformation identification, uh, and in almost all the use cases that I'm seeing around the world where natural language processing has been deployed uh, to help with the COVID response, uh, most of these applications are using human in the loop systems uh, to gradually build up more training data as they go. So within human in the loop machine learning, active learning is one important piece, which is uh, selecting the right items for review. Uh, so let's begin with a with an example. Uh, so just imagine that you have millions of news headlines, which could be something like the cholera outbreak was first seen in a San Francisco supermarket. And then you want to find all the headlines related to outbreaks. Uh, so maybe you want to look at the history of outbreaks for social analysis, maybe that you can bring up um, uh, analytics to, uh, to understand patterns of outbreaks or maybe it's to build an early alert system when you see new news headlines or blogs or uh, social media posts about potential outbreaks, which is that use case that I've, I've worked in, in the past. So uh, you can imagine that in addition to just knowing whether it was relevant or not, you might want to also extract information, say the type of pathogen and the location. So you might want to extract E. coli as the pathogen and San Francisco as the location um, out of this headline. Uh, however, you probably don't have budget to look at the millions or tens of millions of headlines that, that come out every month uh, around the world manually. Uh, so you might have budget uh, for very limited training data, a very limited number that can be put in front of a human, uh, uh, but you still need something around 80% accuracy when you actually build a machine learning model. And so uh, active learning uh, is the process of trying to get to that accuracy uh, as efficiently as possible. Uh, but there's uh, three reasons that you might deploy active learning systems, accuracy just being one of them. Um, so accuracy, so for example, you only have budget to annotate 1% of your unlabeled data. Uh, how can you make that as accurate as possible? Uh, speed is another reason. So you might want your model to be more accurate uh, more quickly. Uh, and this is something that I've used active learning for a lot in the past as well. Uh, in the past, when I've responded to sudden onset disasters uh, in places like Haiti and in Pakistan um, and in healthcare related uh, situations and in places like Malawi, uh, worked in languages which are not widely spoken. Um, and especially in the case of, of sudden onset disasters, we would need to build systems fairly quickly for things like machine translation, where there wasn't any existing data. Uh, so we had uh, certainly lots of people um, who were willing to, to volunteer and help out with translation between languages. Um, but what was most important for us was the ability to scale and launch machine learning services as quickly as possible. Uh, so speed uh, more than the cost of annotation was important in, in these use cases. Uh, and then finally, uh, diversity is another reason why you want to deploy active learning. Uh, so especially if you come from an academic background, you might uh, think of your unlabeled data as a random sample. Uh, if you come from industry, you know that that's just never true. Uh, your data starts out biased. Uh, you're probably sampling data uh, in uh, prestige languages like English more than other languages is a very obvious example. Uh, but then maybe you also have more data which comes from wealthier people who tend to engage with things like social media more or tend to be more engaged in the news and the production of media. Um, you can imagine in, in other uh, use cases like, for example, more uh, wealthy people tend to take photographs and, and post them on social media. Uh, so it's a real problem across all kinds of data types, whether that's text or, or images or, or videos, is that a random sample of whatever data you have probably is already biased. Uh, and so active learning is then a method that you can employ um, to ensure greater diversity in the data that actually gets a human label. Um, so you're not perpetuating those biases in your, your downstream machine learning models. To get an idea of a, a human loop system as a whole and where active learning fits, uh, we can start here on the left and uh, think about a deployed machine learning model. Uh, so let's say we have a really simple task here, uh, uh, predicting a label. So this could be predicting, uh, is this related to an outbreak uh, news headline uh, example that, that we looked at just before. Uh, and so active learning is then looking at the unlabeled items that are interesting for humans to look at. And we'll, we'll drill down on what interesting means in, in the rest of this talk. Uh, annotation is the process of human labeling these items and that creates the training data uh, that uh, we can plug back into our deployed machine learning model and thereby create uh, this loop. 
so for example, what's uh, confusing to our model um, in one loop uh, could then be annotated, could then become part of our training data and no longer confusing for the model going forward. So the idea is our, our model can get smarter in different ways um, in this cyclical uh, process. And then to round it out, transfer learning is um, uh, the process of adding existing information that is in other models. Uh, so I'll go into some other examples uh, of different parts of human the loop, uh, but today the focus is, is going to be on, on active learning. Uh, and so all of the examples here today are, are drawn from uh, my book, Human in the Loop Machine Learning. Uh, so like I said, I'll concentrate mainly on these chapters, uh, three to six for active learning. Uh, but I will have a couple of examples um, related to active learning uh, in uh, which come from sections on advanced quality control and then user interfaces uh, for, for data annotation. And uh, yeah, stay tuned to the, um, at the end of this talk. I'll give you a discount code uh, to get 50% off if you'd like to, to borrow the book. Um, and I'll post that in the, the Zoom chat right now as well. I, I appreciate any feedback and would, would love everyone to uh, to get my book as affordably as possible. Uh, so before we, we jump into the examples, um, a couple of tips and things to watch out for with active learning, uh, especially if you're, you're coming from a machine learning background, uh, because uh, active learning differs in, in a couple of key ways from machine learning in terms of how we evaluate the success of active learning. Uh, so for one, if we're looking at the, the learning curves, we, we tend to look at the x-axis. Uh, in, in active learning. Uh, so let's say here we have uh, two strategies that we're comparing, random sampling on our data and then active learning. So you can see on the x-axis, uh, we're increasing by a, a thousand labels. So we're going from 1,000 uh, randomly sampled labels to, to 10,000 and we're using active learning to be smarter about how we uh, sample uh, these labels. And so what we look at here is uh, the reduction in human labeling cost. Uh, so let's say our our target um, was to get to a 60% accuracy. Uh, then we're looking at what, how, uh, how few labels do we need compared to random sampling. So there's something like, uh, let's call that 7,600 labels, uh, which are needed for um, random sampling to get a 60% accuracy uh, and about 3,500 for um, uh, when we use active learning. So this is a, a reduction in, in almost 60%. Or to put it another way, you could say it's, it's you know, something like takes 120% more labels by random sampling um, than via active learning. Uh, if you come from machine learning, then obviously when the, the data is the same between models and you're looking at learning curves and just looking at different model architectures, you tend to care more about the y-axis, uh, the, the change in accuracy given the same data, but different architectures. Uh, but because the goal of active learning is to re reduce the number of labels, um, and it's different data sets, um, you want to concentrate on the x-axis. Uh, and so uh, it's obviously a substantial difference. You know, we're looking at a 60% difference here. If you looked at that, that equivalent y-axis, um, you know, it's, it's only about 10-15% uh, difference. Uh, so I've certainly seen people come from a machine learning background, look at graphs like this and, and think that it's not a, a very substantial difference. Um, when the, you know, the, the expensive thing that you're doing here is the human labeling component. And uh, another way that active learning can differ from machine learning evaluation uh, in terms of machine learning architectures versus active learning um, approaches is that active learning tends to get better on real world data. Uh, so if you have a, a data set where uh, it's a not a very diverse data set, uh, your training data and, and test data are both pulled from the, the same distribution and you have an equal number of labels, uh, you're probably not gonna get a, a very, uh, very accurate or, or a very big increase rather uh, from using active learning as your strategy. Uh, in in uh, very balanced and uh, you know, very simple uh, tasks, uh, random sampling um, you know, might be almost optimal already. Um, however, um, uh, if you have real world data where you have many labels, uh, there can be a very imbalanced distribution between those labels, some are very frequent, some are very infrequent. Uh, the data changes uh, over time. Uh, so let's just say data that, that changes over time, like data that changes data over time, <laughs> changes domain maybe. Um, and uh, contexts where you can draw from a very large unlabeled pool of data. So again, unlike academic data sets that might have already been filtered down to a few tens of thousands of examples at most, 
uh, or you have millions of examples to choose from. So our use case of headlines, uh, news headlines is a great example here. Uh, you might have many different labels that you care about if you're, you're trying to do different kinds of topic classification. Obviously, some of those topics are going to be more frequent than others, uh, perhaps by orders of magnitude. The topics uh, change over time, uh, and the context where you can draw uh, from is a very large unlabeled pool. So there are lots of information in the, in the media out there. So flip side of this is to, to debunk uh, three active learning myths. Uh, one is that active learning and random sampling converge with enough data. Um, this uh, only tends to happen on academic data sets um, where active learning is, is, is simulated. So if you only have 10,000 training items or 100,000 training items and, and you try all of those out, once you've sampled 100,000 by any method, it's, it's obviously going to have the, the same accuracy. Um, but this tends not to be the case in real world data where you have a very large pool uh, to, draw, to draw from. Uh, I've seen it commonly thought that uncertainty is tractable and can be read directly from softmax. Uh, in, in fact, you can't um, uh, interpret the confidence in your prediction as a heuristic for anything other than binary prediction tasks. Or you, you can't uh, optimally decide what your uncertainty is. It's actually a complicated task in itself um, that can require optimization. Uh, and, and finally, um, the most overlooked variable for um, uh, for active learning is uh, the base of softmax, or equivalently, the, the temperature that you apply to the softmax output. Um, uh, there are many cases where Euler's number is, uh, is a special one. Uh, it's not the case uh, for, for how we optimize uh, the, the base of our softmax algorithms. Uh, it's, it's arbitrary, um, and it'll actually change the rank order of active learning results. So with all that in mind, um, let's think about different approaches to active learning. Um, in terms of the knowledge that our machine learning model has. And then this will motivate where the, uh, the different solutions uh, come in. So I like to, to think of machine learning in terms of a knowledge quadrant. So if it's in a knowledge quadrant before, uh, it's something that divides up the world into your known knowns, your known unknowns, your unknown knowns, and your unknown unknowns. And so your known knowns are your model in its current state. Anything that your model is familiar with, that it can predict confidently and get correctly, that's what your model knows that it knows. Uh, what your model knows that it doesn't know are things close to the decision boundary. Uh, so your known unknowns, uh, for example, in a binary prediction task, everything predicted with 50% confidence. Um, so that is your model telling you that, hey, this is something that uh, I really don't know the, the label for. Uh, then your unknown unknowns, are, needless to say, are a much harder set of, of items to predict. Uh, how can you know what your model doesn't know? Um, and so these are uh, things which aren't present in your training data at all, uh, which could lead your model to be erroneously confident um, when it shouldn't be. And we won't be going into too much detail on it here today, but uh, to round out the quadrant, you could think of transfer learning as your unknown knowns. So if you're latent information in other models that you can adapt to your task, we don't know what that information is yet, uh, which is why it's your, your unknown knowledge. Uh, and so these can all be addressed um, in different parts of the human in the loop system. And we'll be concentrating on this right column today. Uh, so uncertainty sampling, which is looking at where your model is uncertain, and diversity sampling, which is looking for gaps in your, your model knowledge. Uh, so starting with uncertainty sampling, uh, this is where your model is uncertain. So to, uh, to go back to our example of news headlines, uh, this could be what words are confusing our model as to whether they are locations or some other entity. So you can imagine that if you had uh, the word San Francisco in there, that obviously looks like a location, but maybe you had San Francisco 49ers um, in, uh, in the news headline. Uh, and you can see why that would be confusing uh, because the 49ers are a sports team, so they're an organization uh, they're, they're not a location, uh, even though they're, they're named after a city. Um, and if you're from here, you'll know that the San Francisco 49ers have not been in San Francisco for many years. They, <laughs> um, I guess about five years ago now, they, they moved to San Jose, a, a neighboring city. Um, so it wouldn't be accurate even to interpret the, uh, the San Francisco part, of San Francisco 49ers. Uh, so that is the, the kind of example where, with that conflicting kind of information, a machine learning model might be uncertain. And so to visualize this, we can, we can think of a binary classification task uh, like this, where we have two labels, label A and B. And so uncertainty sampling are looking for items near that decision boundary. Uh, so these are the items that would be about 50% confident in a, 
uh, binary classification task. And because they're near the decision boundary, uh, they're more likely to be misclassified today. Um, so getting a human label on those unlabeled items um, is more likely to update uh, our model um, in a way that makes more accurate than just random sampling. So for all of the uncertainty sampling algorithms, or indeed all of the active learning um, uh, systems that we'll look at today, it goes through the same strategy of, let's go back, of looking at all of the unlabeled items and then deciding which have the highest score for a given metric. So for a given uncertainty sampling metric, uh, what are the five most uncertain looking items of all the unlabeled items? So that would be the five that are here. Uh, and as we'll see, there are lots of different metrics that we might use, which will produce different um, uh, potential sets of items that, uh, that you could get a human label for. Uh, so for the uncertainty sampling uh, examples, we'll have a um, uh, output here uh, from something like softmax, which is a probability distribution. Uh, strictly, these aren't uh, probabilities, there, there are something less than that, uh, but I won't go into the shortcomings of, of softmax here. Uh, although technically, if you have items that add 100%, um, then uh, that is a probability distribution. So that's where the name comes from. Uh, so here, let's assume that we have a four-way classification system and that uh, Y1 is what we're most confident in, Y2 is what we're second most confident, etc. It's about 65% confident for the most confident thing. Um, and this can be expressed as a PyTorch tensor um, uh, with uh, this expression like this here. And for uh, all of the examples that you see here today, uh, I have an open source PyTorch library. And I've also written a, a few articles on the official PyTorch blog um, about that library and, and the different methods. Uh, so if you're not sure you want to jump in and buy my book, um, that library is out there. It's free and open source. Um, um, obviously, those uh, articles are out there as well as a starting point. So how do we interpret uncertainty from a probability distribution? Well, the, the most obvious way is, is probably the one that you've, you've been using, is, which is just to look at the difference between the most confident prediction and 100% confidence. Uh, so the most confident prediction was about 64% confidence here. Um, and so you can say the inverse of that, okay, is about 35% confidence. Uh, and the rest of this equation here is uh, just to, to normalize that. Um, so 35% uh, uncertainty rather, 65% confident, 35% uncertainty. It's going to become something a, a little bit larger because um, uh, that confidence couldn't have been less than 25%. Uh, so that's the normalizing factor. Um, what it does is it gives us a, a score uh, so that we know once we apply this metric across all of our unlabeled predictions, um, those which have the score closest to one are the most uncertain. So they're the ones that we are going to sample more. Uh, and then uh, that's the least confidence. Uh, margin of confidence, um, similar principle, but we're looking at the top two most confident predictions. Uh, so in this case, rather than looking at the most confident relative to 100% confident, we're looking at um, how conflicted the model is about the, the top two most likely predictions. So we're looking at the, the difference between them. Uh, and again, we're, we're just normalizing um, uh, so that it could be on a, um, a zero to one scale. And similar to margin of confidence, we have uh, ratio of confidence. Um, so instead of looking at the difference between the first and second most confident prediction, we're looking at the ratio between them. Uh, and technically, this is actually what a lot of neural models should be optimizing for, that the, the ratio uh, between um, the, the items reflects uh, the relative frequency in the actual training data. Um, but you can obviously get like uh, pathological results and, and fit the data in, in various ways. Uh, and the, uh, the fourth heuristic that, that we can use uh, then looks at all of the, the different metrics. Uh, so entropy looks at the difference between all the metrics um, and uh, the non-result of them all being exactly 25% in, in this case with the, the four examples. And again, this is a normalizing factor on the bottom uh, so that we can have a score where one would be the, the most uncertain. And so to get a feel for uh, these different kind of algorithms, uh, we, can, we can plot these uh, as if it was a, a 2D task. And here we have all of these black 
dots uh, as different labels and then we're looking at the regions which um, have the most uncertainty so which would have the score closest to one uh, for each of these metrics so needless to say the the margin of confidence and ratio of confidence that looked at those top two most confusion uh, confusing uh, labels uh, they're optimizing for for pairwise confusion whereas entropy uh, which looks at confusion across all of the labels um, is maximizing for uh, the three-way confusion here let's have a look at this um, this link here I'll share this on the zoom as well okay so if you go to uh, my site here I've implemented these in a way that you can play around with yourself so you can click on any of these to put some in place so you can see here with just two labels it's um, you know more or less narrow and in, in terms of the distribution but it's fairly similar um, and as we add other labels the areas of confusion differ quite a bit with entropy really trying to optimize just some confusion between uh, between all of the labels uh, and so I advise you to, to, to go in and uh, play around with this visualization and, and try to get a feel for uh, the ways that the different <laughs> uh, the different uncertainty sampling algorithms work uh, because this can give you an idea of what might be the most important for your data. Um, it may be the case where confusion between the, the two most important labels or, um, is what you're looking for in, in your business case and the problem you're addressing um, or it might be that confusion across all the labels is the most important. Um, this will be determined by, by your particular use case. Um, um, and. Um, also can be determined programmatically. Uh, so uh, given enough uh, data labels, uh, you can test for yourself which of these methods is the most likely to produce misclassified items uh, and also which is the most likely to produce items that when they get a correct label uh, result in your, your model becoming more accurate. So uh, some more advanced methods um, rely on ensembles or, or Monte Carlo dropouts. Um, and so uh, the ensemble methods have been around a really long time. And uh, as it sounds, you take a number of models, you take an ensemble of models, and you get predictions across those multiple models. And then you look at how much those predictions vary. Uh, so you can look at just at whether the, uh, the labels vary in terms of the most confident label, or you can look at your probability distributions and, and see what the, uh, the variance is across your different models. And the, the idea there is that if there is more variance across different models, um, that's a form of uncertainty in itself. Uh, one of the, uh, the cool recent ways that, that people have extended this idea within a single model is to use Monte Carlo dropouts. Uh, so you've probably used dropouts during the training process before where you don't want your model to overfit so you're, you're randomly ignoring um, a handful of the, the neurons in, um, in training epochs or, or maybe, uh, maybe the edges but probably the neurons. And so uh, you can use this same principle in prediction. Uh, so taking a, a single model uh, getting multiple predictions and then dropping out uh, different neurons with each of those predictions, you can then look at which of the items varied the most across those predictions. Um, and then uh, that tells you that this particular model has the, the least strong hypothesis about what, uh, what the actual labels should be, uh, and therefore that's a more uncertain uh, item. Uh, you sometimes this, uh, see, you'll sometimes see this called Bayesian deep learning. Um, which is kind of, I think, pretentious name for what it really is. It's a really simple method. Uh, it's called that because if you squint at the, the outputs, um, once you're using this method at inference time, it kind of looks like a normal Gaussian curve, um, and, and therefore it's called Bayesian deep learning. Um, uh, in reality, I think it's just kind of like a nice way to I don't know, shake up the model a little bit and, and, and see what moves around the most. Okay, so that is uh, uncertainty sampling. So those are different methods for trying to work out what your model knows that it doesn't know today. Uh, so in contrast, diversity sampling is the much harder problem of looking for gaps in your current model knowledge. And so an example from our uh, news headlines would be words are confusing our model at potential locations because they've never uh, been seen before. Uh, so if you didn't have uh, other locations, like other towns in the Bay Area, so it's like, Oakland or, or Santa Rosa, uh, they might be in contexts 
where there could be locations, there could be organizations a little bit ambiguous in the text. And because you haven't seen those examples previously in your news headlines, uh, your model uh, might actually have a confident prediction, but it, it's, it's not getting it um, correct uh, because it simply isn't represented in the, the training data previously. And so the, uh, the set of techniques uh, for trying to discover um, what's absent from the training data or what's absent from confident predictions in, in, your, um, in your model are known as diversity sampling. So uh, to, to look at our, our 2D example again, diversity sampling would have the goal of looking at items that are, are maximally different from what has been annotated previously um, and are also uh, maximally different from each other. Uh, so in this case, uh, a diversity sampling algorithm might sample these five items as being the, the most different from anything that have been seen before and, and from each other. Um, uh, then hypothesize that, well, that the model might be getting these wrong because it doesn't see anything like them. And so these are things that we want to put in front of a human for review. So depending on what you're trying to target, there are uh, different kinds of methods for uh, diversity sampling. Um, one, uh, to, to continue on, on uh, mo model probing techniques or model-based outliers. Uh, so sampling for, for low activation in, in logits and, and hidden layers. Uh, so one thing that softmax hides is, is the um, is the absolute scale of the the data uh, that's going into it. So if you have input of one, two, three, and four in, in your logits going into softmax like this, um, the probability distribution that comes out is exactly the same as as if the logits were uh, 101, 102, 103, 104. Uh, so it's all about the relative value between them, um, not the the absolute value. Uh, and so that's losing some really valuable information because it doesn't allow you to distinguish confusion in your model because of a lot of conflicting information versus confusion because of the absence of information. So model-based outliers is a technique uh, for allowing you to see uh, what your model is telling you that it hasn't seen much of before. Uh, and uh, depending on which hidden layers you look at, um, this can uh, tell you different things about uh, the kind of outliers um, uh, that you would sample. So for example, if uh, like in the graph here, you're, you're taking something from the, the logits or the, the second to last layer, uh, this is an outlier in terms of the model's predictive ability. Uh, so it doesn't contain much information, uh, which allows it to make a prediction about one of these labels. Uh, so it's already a little bit biased towards what your model can and can't currently predict, um, but in a good way. Uh, so it's telling you what's an outlier in terms of what's predictive. Whereas if you looked at the, um, uh, the earlier layers of your model or, or indeed even the inputs itself, um, then you're, you're really just looking at the, the training data itself. Um, and so the, the simplest possible method is, is not even looking at the model. You could just look at, you know, like the, the number of, of tokens, um, uh, how represented they are in your data compared to, um, uh, in, in a given item compared to your existing training data. Uh, and so this is something you can experiment with uh, to work out what is the right kind of outlier strategy. Uh, the second example here, uh, cluster-based sampling, is probably the, the most well-known approach to uh, diversity sampling. And so it is using unsupervised learning to pre-segment the data, and then you sample equally uh, from the different clusters. And you can do this with clustering algorithms, uh, I've seen done with topic modeling and, and other kinds of unsupervised um, stratification techniques um, as well. Uh, and one advantage here is if you have uh, data with, with a, lot of, uh, a lot of redundancy. So again, in, in our news headlines example, uh, let's imagine that you collected um, most of these headlines in, in cricket season. I'll, I'll use an Australian analogy for everyone joining in, in Australia. Uh, and so 90% of the articles were, were, about, um, were about cricket. And so uh, if you just randomly sampled or only looked at um, confusion um, and uncertainty, 90% um, of it might be around that one category. So especially if you know this is probably true, but you don't have any labels and hypothesis yet, uh, clustering is, is a nice way that um, you can say to yourself, well, I'll, I'll make 10 clusters. I'll, I'll assume that all these cricket ones will end up in one cluster. Uh, and then I'll sample equally from all those clusters. Um, so that way you're getting more diversity to begin with um, and you're getting it in, in a way that's reasonably well mo motivated mathematically uh, because you're, you're building these clusters 
um, uh, perhaps on the, the same features um, that you're using for, for the model itself. Uh, related to clustering, the, the first example here, uh, representative sampling, is one of the items most representative of the target domain. So to, to continue the, uh, the headline example, the newspaper headline example, uh, you might have training data leading up to a period in time, uh, say halfway through last year, uh, but then you want to apply your model uh, to uh, the second half of, of last year. Um, and yeah, obviously, uh, especially if you're looking at things like uh, disaster response related headlines, um, the, the domain shift, um, first with the fires and then with COVID would be very substantial. Uh, and your older model would not be accurate. So representative sampling would be looking at the unlabeled pool of everything from uh, the, the last six months, the, the unlabeled items, uh, looking at what were most typical of the last six months relative to what was already in the training data, and then oversampling those items. So uh, sampling items less that look like older data, sampling items more that uh, look new and were common, but, but weren't yet in the, the training data. Uh, and this is a really simple example where it's really like just implemented as if it was two clusters here. Um, in, the, in the book, I go into a lot of different ways that you can do representative sampling. Uh, so if you ever looked at the problem of domain adaptation, uh, this is the method that you're, you're using there. In, in academia, you'll, you'll see domain adaptation posed as a purely automated process. Uh, in industry, I've always seen it implemented with humans in the loop, uh, getting at least some additional human labels uh, to, to adapt quickly to, to new domains. And uh, the final example of uh, real-world diversity sampling, um, oh, sorry, the final example is real-world uh, diversity sampling. Uh, so this increase in fairness uh, with data supporting uh, real-world diversity. Uh, so in this case, you're looking at uh, real world demographics that you care about for your data and ensuring that you're representative um, of those different demographics. Um, so for example, uh, let's assume a demographic that we cared about was um, different nations and you're only looking at headlines uh, from, uh, you know, let's say uh, the Australian Broadcasting Corporation. You might find that uh, it over uh, reported on, um, on Australia, um, uh, Australia's close neighbors um, and countries with um, the same language spoken or close economic ties or historical ties to Australia. Um, uh, so over-reporting uh, about the USA, or about the United Kingdom um, and uh, parts of Asia, which are just most local um, uh, to Australia. And uh, in addition to having that bias in, in terms of the overall number of stories, uh, you might also find that the distribution of topics was non-representative. Uh, so for example, it might be um, uh, too common uh, for the media to only report uh, about disasters in sub-Saharan Africa, um, because that is a, a common media narrative. And uh, you don't want that bias in, in what is considered a, a worthy story internationally to, to be in your data. Um, and so then you would want to codify the regions of the world where the different stories are reported from um, and then look for ways uh, to adjust the sampling uh, so that you are getting a fairer distribution of the different topics of stories uh, across, the, um, across the different uh, locations. Uh, and this is something that can be applied to, to any demographic uh, that you want to, want to track. Um, and it's uh, one of the pieces in, in making your data uh, fairer across more demographics. Okay, so those are uh, approaches to, to active learning, uncertainty sampling and diversity sampling. When deployed, uh, most of the time you're gonna use these in parallel. Uh, and so to, to continue our example, uh, you might look at uh, ways to find uh, words that are confusing to your model as ambiguous and have also never been seen before. Um, uh, so it might be, you know, something uh, like Oakland, where it hasn't seen it before. Uh, there are sports teams uh, named after the city, uh, and so it's just uh, unknown and ambiguous uh, to, to the model in its current state. And so in our 2D visualization, it might look something like this. We want items which are close to the decision boundary, and we want those items to be different from each other. We don't want to sample items which are all just from one part of the, the problem space. And so a good active learning strategy that combine uncertainty sampling and diversity sampling 
if you had the budget of only um, <laughs> five human labels on, on this data set, um, it might select these five items uh, for, uh, for human review and labels uh, so that you can then update the model. A uh, really simple way to, to combine uh, the method you've already seen are to combine uncertainty sampling and clustering. Uh, so in the first step, you apply uncertainty sampling and then you reduce that pool uh, to only items some distance from the decision boundary. Um, so this visualization here, you can see it's about half the items. Uh, let's call that something like everything in the 40 to 60% confidence range. So you know that you know, these aren't necessarily the most uncertain items from your model, but they all have a fairly high degree of uncertainty. Uh, then within those uncertain items, uh, you apply clustering. Uh, and so that ensures that you get a diverse selection rather than just our, our early example where you're, you have that, that one tiny group of uncertain items all close to each other. Uh, and this um, is a really simple method, just uh, taking uh, you know, an uncertainty sample direct from, from our softmax and then applying a simple clustering algorithm. It's also incredibly effective. Um, this might be as accurate as a lot of uh, much more sophisticated methods that you can try. So I certainly recommend you're trying out these techniques uh, build these building blocks, um, uh, test them out in combination, and then think about building some of the more sophisticated examples. Um, but <laughs> with that caveat, here's one of the more sophisticated examples. Um, so one of the, um, the most revolutionary changes in, in recent years um, in, in natural language processing has, has been transfer learning. Um, so actually, I think last time I, I spoke at the, the Sydney Natural Language Processing Meetup, I, I spoke on uh, a transfer learning and, and it stayed in, in NLP. Um, so I, I, as a refresher, everyone, um, uh, transfer learning is the process where you take a model which was uh, built for one purpose uh, and then you retrain some or like a large part of that model um, for a different purpose. So in this example here, let's say I have a model trained to predict labels A, B, C, and D. We can replace that output layer. Um, we can have data labeled with W, X, Y, and Z, let's say, and uh, retrain uh, just that output layer. Um, if we want, it could be more layers, but in the case, just that output layer to, uh, to predict those new labels. And what's nice is that because we're predicting, uh, because we're retraining only uh, that one layer, we can do it with far fewer labeled items. Uh, and so it's a nice way uh, to reduce the overall number of, of training items that we need, similar active learning, uh, um, and still get an accurate model. And what's nice about transfer learning is that these other labels can be anything you want them to be, and they can be uh, aspects of your current model. Uh, so for example, you can take your current model that predicts A, B, C, and D, and let's say we want to make that more accurate. We, our goal here is to make the, the, the model prediction A, B, C, and D more accurate. So we want to know which of our unlabeled items um, are the most likely to be in, predicted incorrectly today. How can we um, get those in front of a human, find out what their actual label is, get them back into the model. So we can take a held out data set, a validation data set. We can get predictions over that and we can then bucket those. Uh, so we can bucket all the ones that were correct into the correct bucket. We can bucket the incorrect ones into an incorrect bucket. Uh, and then we can use transfer learning to create a new output layer, um, which just predicts correct or incorrect. Uh, so what's nice about this is that this can work with any kind of data and any number of labels. Uh, so there's four labels in this example here. There's a hundred labels. We can still bucket that into correct or incorrect. Um, you know, if this was a sequence extraction task or a sequence generation task or computer vision, a, a bounding box or semantic segmentation task. Um, in all cases, you can use validation data, bucket things as correct or incorrect uh, or degrees of correctness, uh, and then train a new layer on your model uh, to predict whether or not you're correct. Um, uh, once you have that, that new model then, uh, with this, this new output layer to predict correct or incorrect, you can apply that across your perhaps millions of, of unlabeled data items. Um, and then for each of those, get a prediction about what's correct and incorrect. Uh, so uh, this is a really uh, powerful way uh, to use transfer learning uh, to get what can often be a more accurate uncertainty sampling prediction. And then it has this really nice property as well in that it can be inherently adaptive. So you know that later on, 
the items that you sample are going to get a human label. Uh, and what we also know is that once items get a human label, we're going to we're going to predict those items correctly again. Our models tend to overfit a little bit or a lot, and so anything that looks a lot like our training data, um, we're we're going to predict that with the exact same label again. And so what we can do is that we can say you know pretend that we uh, selected these ten items which are incorrect uh, from our unlabeled data. We know that we're going to get them correct later. So we can now put them in the correct bucket and then retrain our, uh, retrain our, our model with the new, with new output layer. And we don't have to have a human in the loop for this. So we don't yet know what that label is. We don't yet know whether the labels are going to be A, B, C, or D. Uh, but we do know that we're, we're going to get these ones almost certainly correct when we retrain the model later. Uh, and so what that means uh, is that we can iteratively retrain this model with batches at a time um, uh, and make it adaptive and so that we're not always getting the same kinds of uncertain items. And we can do this in one batch. So especially if you can only employ humans for a certain amount of time, uh, you can't have them continually looking at data, it's much easier for you to batch data for human review, uh, then this is a nice adaptive way uh, that builds on the knowledge that you are going to get some of these items correct or most of these items correct later um, and allows you to sample in a, in a much, much faster way. So that is, um, uh, that's active learning. Uh, so now with, with just a few minutes remaining, I just want to share some of the other uh, fun things going on um, <laughs> around active learning, uh, which I, I cover more detail in, in my book. Uh, so in transfer learning, um, there's a lot of really interesting recent work in uh, what's known as uh, intermediate training. So I'm, I'm sure you're all familiar with um, uh, recent popular methods of taking very large pre-trained models um, like, like BERT or ELMO or, or Roberta or XLMR as it's known um, and using those um, uh, to tune or using them as embeddings um, in models. Uh, but in addition, uh, there's been interesting recent work showing that uh, adjacent models can also be useful when used as representations. Uh, so to give her a concrete example here, let's say we're looking at our, our headlines example. Let's say we're looking at the, the task of extracting pathogens. Uh, so the, the names of uh, diseases and, and disease outbreaks. Uh, it, could, it could take a fair amount of time to go in and manually label the pathogen in, in every piece of text and in, in every headline. It's going to be a lot quicker for someone just to quickly go, is this about an outbreak? Yes or no. And so you've got a, a model where it might be 10 times or 100 times faster for people to simply do the binary yes or no labeling task um, relative to the, the entity tagging for, for the pathogen itself. And so you can use that, that, that model that's just predicting whether or not it is uh, related to a disease outbreak. That could be a, a Y and Z model here. Uh, and uh, have that as an embedding or representation or a tuned model uh, that feeds into your sequence model um, that is trying to predict the name of those pathogens uh, in context. Um, you get a, an incredible boost here um, when you do have this situation where you can get a lot more labels uh, cheaply or, or maybe as a byproduct of something else that, that you're doing. Uh, and so um, some interesting recent work on this um, is by uh, Yada uh, Pukachikan and, and co um, from NYU. Um, uh, one paper is about to be uh, presented at ACL, um, the other is currently under review. Uh, and the second one is super interesting. So they, they found that um, an intermediate task in English could improve the performance on other languages. Um, so JSON doesn't even have to be that adjacent uh, for, for these things uh, to work. And uh, super excited that um, uh, the next speaker at the Bay Area NLP meetup that I run is, is going to be Yada presenting about, about her work at, um, at NYU and, and, and this task. Uh, so I think we're, we're really just at the, the beginning here of looking at ways in which um, we can combine pre-trained models, um, adjacent tasks um, uh, into, um, into the actual task that, the we're, um, that we're looking at. Um, and as far as I know, no one yet is explicitly looking at uh, designing annotation interfaces to take advantage of this. But I think that's something we'll, we'll see a lot of uh, uh, coming soon. And uh, 
On on the notion of efficient annotation, uh, something else that you can take advantage of with with active learning and and human the loop processing. Uh, so like predictive encoding. So you can make annotation much faster and quality control much easier, although it can uh, perpetuate bias. So let's say we already have our models and they can already predict locations. Um, the, the raw interface on the left, we're asking people to highlight in the text is slow and it's prone to error as well. People might accidentally um, highlight the space or the tokenization might not be great. Um, people might be off uh, by a couple of characters or a punctuation. Um, uh, whereas if you already have uh, a couple of predictions about what a location might be, you can cast this as a classification task on the, uh, like on the right hand side. Um, and uh, it's just a, a lot easier when you're doing quality control for human annotation um, uh, to do quality control over a classification task relative to, to a sequence highlighting task. Um, and um, if your tokenization is correct, uh, then hopefully you're, you're not going to run into those you know, out by one character errors uh, that you might get elsewhere. And of course, the, the correct name here is San Francisco because nobody calls it San Fran, um, even though for some reason that is a, a nickname in Australia. All right, um, so some, uh, some general advice um, before, we, uh, before we wrap up here. Um, build the system and, and then refine it. So chapter two of my book is a working human loop machine learning system. Uh, for this problem of, of looking at disaster related news headlines in, in 500 lines of code. It has a basic command line interface. It does some basic active learning methods, combining uncertainty sampling and diversity sampling. Um, and it will retrain the model automatically. So, you know, you don't have to have a particularly sophisticated system to get this entire loop going. Uh, so rather than, than try to experiment piecemeal, um, you know, try and optimize you know, the 10 different uncertainty sampling algorithm variants um, and try and optimize for every different kind of interfaces. Um, uh, individually, I recommend getting one system going, working with it yourself, which is the second point here, looking at the data, um, and then, uh, then deciding what you need to, to work on. Do you need better interfaces? Do you need a better quality control? Do you need better instructions? Uh, do you need a more sophisticated machine learning model? Uh, so get something working, get it out first, um, and then think about which places you need to, to apply more time as, as a data scientist. Uh, and the last bit of general advice is uh, to be realistic about time to reach accuracy. Uh, so if you're using active learning or if you're annotating more data for any reason, it's really hard to predict in advance what accuracy that you're going to get to. Um, so from a product perspective, uh, it'll work in your favor if your model is still useful um, before it gets to a certain level of accuracy. Um, and even if you can't get to state of the art within your annotation budget or the amount of um, GPU cycles there that you can purchase, um, uh, you'll still have a, a model um, that is providing value for whatever your end use case is. All right, well, uh, yeah, thanks everyone for, uh, for listening to this presentation. Uh, so I will, uh, be live on the Zoom chat now, uh, so I'm happy to take um, any additional questions uh, over the uh, over the video chat um, uh, rather than uh, over the, the text chat. Uh, you can find out my book um, here if you, if you just use your favorite search engine and and Google Human the Loop Machine Learning. Uh, you can uh, you can find it there as well. All right, and I look forward to your questions. Okay, uh, on behalf of Sydney NLP, thank you very much, Rob Munro. That was an interesting talk and it's always good to have you on. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, so we'll try and have some Q&A now. Like you just saw in the, in the presentation, a bunch of the content is, is already out there on various blogs like PyTorch's blog and, and uh, my own Medium blog. Um, and so that could be a good place to, to jump in uh, there and, and in the, the code that I've released. Um, to uh, get a bit of hands-on experience uh, before you necessarily need to buy the book. Okay, we've got a hand raised. Uh, let's let them speak. Rob? John, mm -hmm. hey, it's been many years. It's been many years, Rob. It's, and I think it's fantastic where you've got to. Congratulations. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. Rob and I, should we say we work together? Uh, back when he was a student at Sydney Uni. Yeah, we, um, we, we 
published papers in the, the original Connell NER conferences. We did indeed. Really enjoyed your presentation and how lucid it, it is and how well it, um, it describes the active learning. Um, for your benefit, I left Sydney Uni in 2012 and I've been running a medical, a clinical NLP company since then. And you have introduced me to a whole lot of things we've been searching for because okay. we do, we do most of our work as, uh, or all of our work as an annotation task, manual annotation task, that I have manual annotation tools. And this gives us a pathway forward to, um, you know, really ramping up the productivity of our work. But uh, I don't have a question. I just have a thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, yeah, yeah, you're 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 very welcome. And um, yeah, I mean, I I think it's a really interesting space. Like, like I said at the start yeah. of the talk, I'm advising a bunch of companies doing COVID response, um, and like you know WHO and, mm. and a bunch of other large, large organizations. So it's uh, yeah, really important area uh, to be working in. Thanks for that, John. Um, I've actually got a question I'd like to ask. So. The fundamentals of active learning at this point are pretty well understood. So you need some way, like some sort of sampling strategy, um, and you need some way of knowing whether or not that strategy is any good. Um, a lot right. of what I understand to be innovation in active learning now basically consists of coming up with new ways of filling out that same framework. Um, <laughs> a, is that reasonable? Um, and B, um, if you had to reinvent active learning and like think of it from a different light, how would you do it? Sure. So, um, yeah, you know, I, I'm not sure if everyone realizes um, how hard active learning is. So, um, like I said, right at the, the start of the talk, um, one of the big myths is that um, uncertainty is tractable, that you can just read um, confidence straight off your softmax output. Um, this is something like just uh, just two weeks ago, um, uh, I got into like a, a Twitter argument with uh, with Lan Yukun uh, uh, about so he's obviously you know one of the so-called godfathers of, of of deep learning, which is a horrible title. Um, but he was making the claim that um, uncertainty was tractable; you can read it straight off the, the softmax output, which is only true for binary tasks. So even some you know, really smart, established people out there maybe don't appreciate that there's different ways that you can calculate uncertainty um, to get your best possible measure it is an intractable problem. Like you have to build a model to actually do that and, and optimize that model. So I would say, um, yeah, it's, it's people who do know about active learning, you're right. The framework's kind of the same that you, you come up with a sampling method and, and try to find the best. And, and that hasn't changed a whole lot. Um, in terms of innovation, um, the most innovation recently has been in the examples I showed um, using Monte Carlo dropouts at inference time. Um, there's uh, maybe, you know, uh, maybe half of the recent active learning research, uh, mainly computer vision, though not in natural language processing, uh, has been in this area. Uh, so ways of, of looking at variation in, in predictions that, that come out of models. Um, and there, are, there is some evidence um, uh, uh, from the statistical community that uh, that is getting better samples of more solvable problems um, than other kinds of uncertainty sampling. Um, but at the moment, that hasn't been tested really much out of academic data. Um, okay. So, yeah, it, it's interesting. So, it strikes me that um, your company would be uniquely interested in this sort of thing. Do you spend much time at work thinking about this? The, the consulting company that, that I run at the moment, I'm uh, I help companies think about the product side of things as much as the, the data side of things. Okay. Um, but a lot of it is active learning. So it's one of my, one of my biggest customers is um, uh, one of the world's largest creator of uh, manufacturing equipment, especially agricultural equipment. I'm mainly helping them in, in computer vision tasks. Uh, so they have a tractor or a combine harvester. Uh, nowadays, they, they ship with computer um, vision models and, then, and, um, and cameras on front. They can automatically determine, you know, what's a weed versus what's a seedling. Um, and uh, actually, if you read my book, um, uh, that's why I have uh, that particular example in, in my actual book. Um, so these companies, you know, like using this in, in fields um, uh, and, and are early readers of my book, uh, give me feedback. So it's pretty fun. You know, like th this is this is an example where if you just get a couple of percent increase um, in efficiency in the yield that you can get from farms, um, the, um, you know, the, 
the economic impacts, environmental impacts are, are all potentially really, really huge. Um, so it's, yeah, um, it's, uh, it's fun to be rolling that out in, um, in my business day to day. But yeah, just with a caveat, mostly I'm, I, I consult on the, um, uh, the product um, and business strategy side. Thanks. We've got another question from the floor, this time from Yuan Yi Zhu. Uh, hello. Thank you, Ben, for the talk and everyone for organizing it. Um, I've got a particular dilemma regarding how to measure success. Um, okay. So I think by definition of the problem, we, all the data that we select for labeling are more difficult or more challenging for our model. Yep. And so when we measure success, um, you know, if we measure on, um, if we do something like cross validation where we include all the new data, we sort of see a decrease in all sorts of measures <laughs> like the F1 scores and totally. all that. Yeah, yeah. But if we keep, if we fix a test set, then we know that we're not using the most challenging data and we're having, we're getting optimal, uh, optimistic estimates of performance. So do right. you have any thoughts regarding that? Yeah, yeah. And I, I, I should have included this in the presentation and I, I go into it in, in, in depth in my book. Um, you should definitely um, evaluate on a held out test set, which is uh, randomly sampled or, or representatively sampled uh, because of exactly this problem. If, um, if you're evaluated on data always at the decision boundary, it's inherently harder um, and it will artificially look like your accuracy is going down. Um, so it sounds like you're doing the right thing um, of evaluating on random held out data. Uh, you have to be super careful that it really is random and held out. It's not um, the random of what's remaining after you've sampled things near the decision boundary, um, because in that right. case, it's, it's going to be um, too easy. Um, but yeah, like the, yeah, the, the most honest answer is um, the, the data set where it is uh, really is a true random distribution. Uh, if you have multiple evaluation data sets, maybe some out of domains, some on tough edge cases, that's fine too. My example code as well. Um, uh, before the model will build, um, anyone running uh, the, the code accompanying my book uh, is forced to annotate data for, um, <laughs> for evaluation first because uh, you, you really want to get that right. That's a good discipline to impose upon your students, I guess. Yeah, you know, it's just good for your own intuition as well. I think that was one of the points at the end of the presentation too. If you, if you look at the data, you're going to get a, a good intuition for, for what kind of methods will help. Do we have any further questions from the floor? I see a couple in the chat here as well, which I'm happy to address. Oh, good. Yeah, let's read that out. So the Atlas technique seems to be addressing the uncertainty sampling rather than the diversity sampling, or have I misunderstood, from Matt Partridge. Matt, you've understood perfectly. Um, <laughs> uh, so with the, with the non-adaptive method, it's exactly that. You're just constructing a model which is predicting uncertainty. Um, but where it also gets diversity is when it's adaptive. Um, so without needing um, additional humans to, to label data, uh, let's say your, your uncertainty sampling is all in, in one region to begin with. But once you know you've got that right and you've updated your, your model to say these are now correct, um, it's no longer going to select for that region. It's going to select for, for other regions. Um, and so in, in that way, um, you're getting diversity um, uh, with, with those iterations. Um, and what's nice is that diversity is kind of determined by, by your model and it's, uh, its confidence given, it's, uh, given that feature space. Um, however, um, like you saw, there are a lot of very different methods for, for diversity sampling. Um, so obviously that's not going to help with demographic diversity or, or um, model-based outliers or other things that you might want to look at um, in addition to the diversity that you'll get from Atlas. Okay. Um, I think that ends the formal part of the proceedings today. So once again, thank you very much for your time, Rob. Um, it was very illuminating. We'll have a... Uh, thanks for having me today. No, it's always a pleasure.